today on PowerPoint with Jack Graham. It's important as you think about how you can be a part of the body of Christ, how we can be better together, that you take a, a, an unbiased and honest evaluation of yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your purposes, your plans, your personality, and to stay humble before the Lord. I want to encourage you to take your Bibles right now and turn with me to Romans chapter 12, the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, and this is our essential gospel series. Romans 12 is one of the great chapters in the Bible. I want to be a Romans 12 Christian, and you will see what I mean by that as we make our way. We're going to take our time through Romans chapter 12 these days. But you'll see what I mean as the Apostle Paul gives us now instructions as to how we are to live out this life that we have been given in Christ. This is the life that you were born to live, born again to live again in Christ. And the title of today's message is Better Together. Don't you love God's church? And in particular, if you are a part of this family, Prestonwood, you love this church. And there's nothing like the church when the church is functioning and fellowshipping together as God intended. We've been talking about being a living sacrifice, our all on the altar. So when we are all in, all on the altar, we will be all in the fellowship of God's church and functioning as a member of this body of Christ. The indisputable fact is we need one another, Amen. that we are better together. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And he said, that's not good because we really need one another. We are to be encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near, what day? The day when Christ returns. And in these last days, in these difficult and even desperate days, we need each other now more than ever. Amen? When you become a Christian, God puts you in a spiritual family. And that's one illustration of what it means to be a part of the church, to be in a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, but we also are told that God puts us in a body, and Paul often illustrates with the physical body, uh, the spiritual body of the church. And that's what this passage is about in front of us today. So look, beginning in verse 3, Romans chapter 12, and let's read together God's word. For by the grace that is given to me, that is Paul an apostle, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and they all do not have the same function. So we, though many as one body in Christ, the church, and individual members, one of another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Why are you here on earth? What is God's plan and God's purpose for your life? If you are a follower of Jesus, it is to glorify him always 
by giving your life to serve him and to minister through his church. Some people have the idea that the way you grow in your faith to be holy, to be righteous, is to get alone, to be by yourself. While there are times that we're to separate and isolate and get alone with God, when you see the life of Jesus, Jesus himself spent time alone. He often spent time alone. But Jesus was also among the people, the most righteous one who ever lived, the righteous one, Jesus, was constantly among the people. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And so you see Jesus touching the leper or blind eyes or ministering to hurting people, to outcasts, and uh, as well as the upper crust of society. He was with all kinds of people. And the Gospels just describe how Jesus was always among uh, the people, healing them, touching them, serving them. And so if you want to be like Jesus, you will also, as a part of his body, now his hands, his feet, we are serving him in community, this body of Christ. The church is Christ the head, He is our head. This is his church. He said, I will build my church, and it belongs to him, and we belong to him, and we are then a part of the body of Christ as we worship together, as we serve together, as we minister together. This means that God has placed each one of us in this body, and it's been said that everybody is somebody in his body, and that means you. We believe together, we are blessed together, we belong together, and that means we are better together. We desperately need the church, and the church is needed in the world and in our community. Uh, Oh, what could happen in our generation if the world could see an empowered and and an engaged church? The church being the church, the church triumphant in our generation. And so as we think about this subject, then there's some things that we do in order to be a part of this body, the church, and how we make things better together. So the first is a word I want to mention, and it's the word humility. Back to verse 3. Look at verse 3 again. Paul says, by the grace given to me, I say, and even in that, Paul is emphasizing his own humility. Paul, an apostle, yet by the grace of God, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Because of the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober or sane judgment, each according to the measure of faith that he has been given. Three times in this passage, the word think shows up. To think about your position in Christ, your identity in Christ. And with that comes humility. Humility. To not think of ourselves with an exaggerated sense of self-importance. So don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. Rather, view yourself through the lens of the holiness of God through Scripture itself because humility has been described as not thinking lowly of yourself or thinking too highly of yourself, but not thinking of yourself at all. Some have the idea that they are humble in that they can't do anything. Don't dare tell God that you can't do anything for him. The Spirit of God is in you. Christ is alive in you. There's a great passage of Scripture in John chapter 13 when Jesus, according to verse 1, knowing that all things were given unto him, he took off his outer robe, took up a towel, and he began to wash the feet of those disciples one by one. He took on the duty, the responsibility of a house servant, often given to the lowest of the servants in the house to wash the feet of of travelers. 
And so when Jesus took that towel and bent down and washed the feet of his disciples, he gave us this example, this perfect example of what humility is, what a servant of God does. You know how to know when you're a servant of God or not? It's when people treat you like one and how you respond. And if our egos are out of control, if we think of ourselves too much, too highly, then we're offended. If someone expects too much of us, we are, we are put off. If someone doesn't respect us, we're put down. Uh, many times in our minds, if people overlook us, Paul says, forget about all that. Don't look at yourself like this, but with sane and sober judgment, and according to the faith that has been given unto you, began to serve the Lord. Humility, like Jesus, knowing who he was, he knew that God had given him all things and yet he served. Humility is knowing who you are in Christ and then acting accordingly in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then comes unity. Unity in verse four. We are better together in the oneness that we've been given in Christ. That's why he talks about the, the body. Verse four again, just look at it. As we are one body, we have many members and the members don't have all the same function in the body. So we have obviously all these parts of the body, some seen and unseen. And every body has been uh, designed and created by God to function when it is healthy, the body is functioning properly. When the body is growing and developing, it is connected one part to another. If you take off a finger and lay it aside, that finger will die. It won't grow because it's disconnected from the body. If you want to know the secret of any great God-blessed church, it is oneness. Our oneness, of course, is in Christ. We believe and are together because of him, and therefore we belong to one another. Jesus prayed in his final hours on earth that his church would be one, that we would be one together in unity. At all costs, we must keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. So what I believe we need to be doing this side of heaven is doing everything that we can to collaborate and cooperate with Christians, and that includes other churches that aren't just like us in order to get the gospel around the world. But with that is diversity. And when you talk about these many parts of the body that we just read about, there is this diversity in the body of Christ. In other words, we all are different, different and we all have different functions in the bodies. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit and there are varieties of service with the same Lord and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in everyone. And then down in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. The body of Christ is diverse just as the physical body is diverse. And we are appreciative of the beautiful variety and diversity that we have in the church. And with this unity and diversity and humility, then comes ministry. So let's take a few moments to talk about the ministry, and in particular, your ministry, verses 6, 7, and 8, speak of spiritual gifts, the charismata, the grace gifts, gifts that are given by grace. That means that when we are graced by God, we are gifted by God. When Christ came into your life, he did not come in empty-handed. He came in bringing birthday gifts, spiritual birthday gifts. You have been gifted by the Spirit, and every Christian has one or more spiritual gifts. They are salvation gifts. They are spiritual gifts, not natural talents. We say that they are supernatural in that they come from God. They are the, these are the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. As many as 26, depending on how you count them, gifts of the Spirit described in the New Testament. But right here in Romans chapter 12, Paul mentions seven gifts. They are seven ministry gifts. 
I think it was Warren Wiersbe, the Bible teacher, who said these gifts are not for our enjoyment, they are for our employment. They are not tools to be, or toys to be played with, but tools to work with in building the body of Christ. So you have a spiritual gift, a, a spiritual gift or gifts. And A.T. Pearson gave us a great uh, paragraph on these. I want to take the time to share it. It's so good. He said, everyone has some gift, therefore all should be encouraged. No one has all the gifts, therefore all should be humble. All gifts are for the one body. Therefore all should be harmonious. That is all working together. All gifts are from the Lord. Therefore, all should be uh, contented. All gifts are mutually helpful and needful. Therefore, all should be studiously faithful. All gifts promote the health and strength of the whole body. Therefore, none can be safely dispensed with all gifts depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all should keep in close contact with Him. That is the Spirit of God. So let me just review very quickly these seven spiritual gifts. Number one is the gift of prophecy. If you were just to put a equals by that, that is the gift of preaching. Now, a prophet is someone who foretells the future. In particular, the Old Testament prophet was a foreteller, but primarily even the prophets in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, were foretellers. In other words, they were declaring the word of God. They were often bringing a word of exhortation or challenge uh, or correction or a call to repentance uh, to people. And this is the, the word of the, pre, of the prophet. It literally means mouthpiece, one who is delivering a message. So translated to today, a prophet is a preacher of the word of God. We who preach are called to preach and commissioned to preach the gospel. We have received this ministry from the Lord, this gifting from God is so essential to the church. It's why we have the pulpit as a sign and a symbol. You can preach without a pulpit. It's a piece of furniture. But this pulpit stands at the core, at the center of this building because everything is built around the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the word of God. Therefore, the church needs preachers. As the old saying goes, you may not think you could ever be a preacher, but God does not call the equipped. He equips the call. And when God calls you, he enables you. With every calling is an empowerment and an enablement to do what God is calling you to do. Number two is serving. It's interesting that the preaching gift and the serving gift are side by side. The serving gift is the act of ministering in a very practical and personal way. And it often is related to the overall proclamation preaching gift because behind the scenes, as you well know, getting together so that we can preach and gather and worship together are hundreds and hundreds of people who are practically serving in a way that is unseen. They're not on the platform. They're not visible. They're not even looking for any kind of applause. They just work. They serve. And those who have this gift don't need to be asked. They just step up and serve. Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. And so when you're serving in this way, you are serving like Jesus. Thirdly is the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching. Preaching and teaching are somewhat different. Teachers have the ability to explain the scriptures. Fourthly, there is encouragement or encouraging, exhortation. It is different than preaching and teaching. The encourager is somewhat, let's call them a motivator, an inspirer. Uh, they're the kind of person when they speak in a public way, you're ready to go out of the building and just charge hell with a water pistol. I mean, they just fire you up. Uh, you know, I, I, you know like, like Scott Turner on our preaching team. Wouldn't you say Scott Turner's an exhorter? Uh, yeah, he is. And, 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 you know, I think about Zig Ziglar. Zig. Uh, he was, you know, such a, an encourager. The word means to come alongside. Para is the word here to exhort, to come alongside of someone and uh, to encourage them. So it can be done in a public way, but thinking about Zig, you know, he sat on the, really the first row right here, all the years he and 
the redhead were a part of our church and taught, and he would be on platforms around the world, known as the world's greatest motivational speaker and salesman and all the rest. It, it, uh, it could be quite something to be speaking to one of the greatest communicators in the world right there in front of you. But did you know Zig was my greatest encourager? Every time after a message, he would come up and say, Pastor, that was a great message. And it challenged me and just encouraged me, even if it wasn't uh, that great. He was an encourager. There are people like that. When, when they come around, they, they cheerlead you. They encourage you. And encouragement can also be done not in a public way, but in a personal way, like a counselor. But to cheer and to comfort and to strengthen, to come alongside, sometimes with a word of correction and accountability, but encouragers, exhorters. Then fifthly, there is giving. Now, every Christian has the responsibility of giving and generosity. We are all to give, just like we, there's a gift of evangelism, but we're all to evangelize. We are all to give and to give generously, but there is the gift of giving. Generosity is a key quality in Christian growth and fellowship in the church. Some of you have deep, deep financial difficulties and demands upon your life. And for some, for many, the reason is you have not partnered with God in giving the first tenth of your income and beyond to the Lord and his work. And you're in trouble because you're not practicing stewardship in your life. You're in trouble financially because you're disobeying God in the area of your finances and your giving. But that said, as all of us are to give, then there are those who are blessed to give in a particular way, gifted to give. Uh, this is a supernatural gift that is a desire to give beyond the ordinary. Uh, this is a person who uh, not only gives financially above and beyond, but maybe gives of their time extra for the Lord. This is the kind of person that has this gift of giving. They just love to bless people. They are faithful and fruitful stewards. They know that they have been entrusted with these gifts. And you don't have to be wealthy to have the gift of giving or to be generous in your giving as far as that goes. I've known people who were living on a very modest income who were gifted to give supernaturally. Then there is leading or ruling. This is administrating, organizing, providing guidance and governance for the church. We're thankful for those who understand finances and understand structures and organizations who are able to put these things together in the leading and the ruling in the administration of the church. You have a spiritual gift. And then fifthly, there's mercy, which is showing kindness and grace to others. It's giving people not what they deserve, but what they don't deserve, which is the mercy of God in your mercy. It's the extraordinary ability to express love and empathy and sympathy and compassion to others. This is the person who goes to the hospital and they make you feel better if you're the patient. You know, some people walk in a hospital room, they make you feel worse. <laughs> but if you have the gift, um, I mean, they're like an advanced agent for the undertaker. But if you have the gift of mercy, you are there with a smile. That's why it says, with mercy and cheerfulness. See that? It's the mercy gift. You, when, they, when you show up with this gift and you help someone who is hurting cheerfully and joyfully, when, when you come beside someone and lift them up when they're broken and fallen, we need the mercy gift in the church. We need people who, who say it's gonna be okay. You're going to get through this. You're going to make it. The people are there just to hold you when you're hurting. This is the mercy gift, to comfort you when you're crying, just to be there. You know, I heard it described, uh, I'm going to land this plane, I promise you, just stay with me. This is good stuff, and you need to hear it. I need to hear it. So I, I heard, you know, the gifts described in this way. Uh, it, it's like you're at a dinner party, and the dessert, let's say, is a pie, falls on the ground. It's knocked off the table and it's on the ground. This is the dessert. So what happens? The person with the gift of preaching, prophesying says, well, you know, the reason that happened is you put it too close to the table and next time you better put that in the center of the table. And the person with the gift of helps or serving said, here, let me, let me pick that up 
and, and just starts doing it without anyone asking them. And then the person with the gift of teaching may say, well, let's look at that pie. Let's take that menu apart right there. Let's see, there's some apples and there's some, and, and starts describing the pie, the kind of pie. And then there's the person who's the encourager, the cheerleader, who says, well, you know what I think we need to do next time? We need to eat dessert first. In fact, let's have two desserts. And then the person who has the gift of giving comes along and says, well, I'll buy next time all the desserts that you want. Let's have more and more uh, desserts. And then uh, the person who's the gift of, of leader or ruling starts organizing everyone to get the table reset and the floor cleaned up. Go get the broom and go get some more plates and gets the organization going. And then the person with mercy says to the person who knocked the plate off the table, says, it's going to be okay. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> Everybody in his body working and functioning together. We're better together. Amen. Discover what God made you to do on mission for him and start doing it as your ministry from the Lord.